Welcome to Warning Shot with former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Joel Rubin and Andy Zemanides, Executive Director of the Hellenic American Leadership Council. Today's special guest is Malcolm Nance, former Naval Intelligence Officer, MSNBC analyst, and New York Times bestselling author. His new book, They Want to Kill Americans, will be released this summer. Now here's Joel Rubin and Andy Zemanides. So, so the cues are growing. Men volunteering to fight. These are some of the thousands who came to collect their weapons today, wondering whether they will use them, and if so, when. Good to be back with you again, Joel. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us on Warning Shot. I'm joining from L.A. today. The Hollywood sign is right outside my uh, window, and this has become a movie. Zelensky is... The 21st century's best action hero right now, but we're coming out on the next chapter, the next act, which looks to be very dangerous. Uh, Joel, where do you think we are right now? Yeah, Andy, thanks. Uh, great frame. And look, th- th- we are now uh, transitioning from the starting phase where there was an expectation that Kiev would fall within the first 24 to 48 hours, and it didn't. As Zelensky, as you point out, he's rallied his country. He's like a Churchillian figure as well to think about wartime leader. Uh, and and now uh, half a million refugees flowing out, Germany ramping up its defense expenditures, the global economic sanctions boom has been lowered, and uh, Putin is threatening nuclear war. Great. So uh, it, it's all moving really fast. And um, I, I, think, I think this is now a completely different phase from what we saw pre before the invasion then the first few days now the ukrainians are digging in and now it looks like we have a real fight on our hands and you know to to talk to give us a special look at that fight and the on the ground look uh joe why don't you introduce our our next guest well we are fortunate and honored and lucky to have the brilliant malcolm nance join us uh malcolm just was on the ground for about a month in the field, learning what's going on first person. Malcolm is a former Naval Intelligence Officer, an MSNBC analyst, four times New York Times bestselling author. And he has a new book coming out this summer called They Want to Kill Americans. It's going to be released. It's going to be phenomenal. Uh, We always learn uh, from Malcolm. Malcolm is a, a national thought leader educating Americans about the threats that we've been facing over the last years, half dozen years in particular, coming from Russia. And so we're really excited to talk with Malcolm about what he sees happening right now uh, with Ukraine. Malcolm, th- uh, thanks for joining us on Warning Shot. Uh, you, you know a lot about the Russians. You've been tracking them for a long time. How nervous is Vladimir Putin right now? And you know, we have a bear kind of in a corner. What what is the danger if he's too nervous? Well, first, I think Vladimir Putin is actually sweating bullets right now. He is really nervous. And there's a reason that he's nervous. He thought that the invasion of, of Ukraine would just be a cakewalk. He thought that he was assured, I'm certain he was assured by his commanders of the Spetsnaz, their commandos, or the SSO is what they call themselves, the Special uh, Security Operations, and uh, the VDV, the Airborne Forces, who apparently have been some of the lead forces uh, in the major combat operations, being followed by armor and other um, you know, mechanized infantry and artillery rocket support forces. I did spend a month in Ukraine. I went there very specifically for my think tank, the Terror Asymmetrics Project. We study asymmetric warfare, and there was not going to be no greater example of asymmetric warfare Then the small country of Ukraine standing up to 75% of the Russian armed forces. That is what is surrounding Ukraine right now. 75% of their army is surrounding that country. And now actively on the invasion. Um, I I just by by sheer happenstance, uh, I got out a few hours before on the last Lufthansa flight out of Ukraine. Uh, just before the airspace was closed and uh, Borspiel Airport was devastated with massive airstrikes. Uh, the reason that Putin is really sweating bullets right now is that this major offensive is stalled. And I mean, you know, there are places where the Russian invasion is moving. Down in Crimea, 
which was going to be a relatively easy push anywhere with a cross over the Crimean Bridge uh, mm -hmm. zone, move on to the town of Kherson to the south, and then turn north up to Melita, uh, yeah, Melita Pole and then Mariupol. That is happening, and we predicted that that would happen. Um, and they would try to then link up to Donetsk. It's the rest of the offensive uh, carried out by, again, 70, you know, over 100 uh, and 50 battalion tactical groups, which constitute 75% of Russia's armed forces. They came in the 42nd Combined Arms Army east of Kharkiv, which is about on the eastern border of Russia, about midway. And that is one of the largest cities in Ukraine. I think it's the second largest city with 1.5 million people. Um, they have been attacking relentlessly there. Uh, they have been repulsed relentlessly. Just last night, uh, they kicked the last uh, remaining Russian army unit out of the city of Kharkiv. And then this morning, they shifted tactics to brute strength warfare. Uh, there's a video circulating right now of a neighborhood where the Russians just used multiple rocket launch rockers, rockets into a, uh, a shopping and apartment complex. The report is there are dozens dead. Uh, we haven't had those numbers coming out of Ukraine in, in, in one area. We've had a lot of Russians killed. Uh, then to the north of Sumy, uh, that town has been uh, under siege for the last couple of days. And then to the north above Kiev in Chernihiv, the Russians have been pressuring that city and then using three lines of advance to come down on the city of Kiev from the northwest to the, the north, the northwest, and a little bit to the northeast. But the bridge bridges have been. So is Kiev surrounded? Is Kiev surrounded? Okay, I'm... let's get this straight because I was on air for the last day. Yeah. I am tracking literally every movement of Russian forces. Kiev is not even started to be surrounded. It is not yeah. surrounded. So why are people saying this? I because mean, a lot of news media tends to be a little hyperbolic about this. Imagine. They are not surrounded. Look. I spent a month. I mean, I lived over there for a month. I, 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 my job was to study all the potential avenues of approach by the Russian army. So I've driven down every highway and roadway from all of these border areas to the city of Kiev. They came down a very predictable route with their main force from the top of the city of Kiev to the northwest. There is a small village up there in, in Belarus called Yeltsk. We knew that they would cross the border there, turn left, uh, and then head straight down towards this town called um, Hotamil, which is where the Antonov Aircraft Factory, the, the place where they build the largest air, aircraft in the world. We also knew the Russians would want to take air bases close to the city, use those as areas of operation where they can mass in helicopters and bring manpower in and marry that up with the armor. They did a hellebore assault on that air base to the northwest of the city. It's about 20 miles northwest of the city uh, in a small village called uh, Buka, Bucha. And the Russians, they, they took the air base for a very short while and they just got wiped out. This morning, intense battles reported in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, as Russian forces enter the city. In fact, they, they actually killed the commander of the Chechen special forces, a major general in that in that air base. So that's back in their hands. To the north from the Chernobyl preserve, we knew that they would come through the radioactive area Chernobyl because their vehicles can take it. They drove straight south and have now been stopped at the village of Ivankiv. That village, there was a, a massacre of Russian tanks there yesterday. The, so let me ask you this. Malcolm, because you've laid out mm. the real um, uh, incredible detail about what's happening on the ground. So it's uh, when you're Vladimir Putin right. and you're looking at this and you're saying my shock and awe failed to shock him. Um, my military is now stuck, tied down. We're now resorting to bombing civilian uh, uh, infrastructure for mm -hmm. what purpose? Who knows? He's got a three-mile convoy, apparently, of tanks slowly meandering around. I mean, no. militarily, what? Where is he going? Like, like, where, where will he be the next three to five days? What, what is their strategy here? Well, their strategy is is twofold. 
First off, there was supposed to be this lightning blitz into Kyiv, and that was supposed to scare the government, make Zelensky leave, fly off to Poland, and then he would just collapse. You have to remember, a lot of the things that, that Putin are doing are very, very much rooted in the 2014 Orange Revolution, right? The Revolution of Dignity. He, you know, that's when his guy, after three days of, you know, after a massive protest, that actually was three months of protest, and then after an ultimatum was given when many, many people were killed, over 100 people were killed in a massacre by the Berkut, the police, secret police, Putin's man, pro-Moscow Yanukovych, jumped onto an executive jet and flew to Moscow. Putin believes that Zelensky was going to do that. <laughs> what they don't understand, and this is what I learned when I was down there. I met the commander of the armed forces. I met the commander of uh, all the tactical forces fighting around Donetsk and Luhansk. These are tough guys. They are not the Ukrainian army of 2014. These people, they kick ass, they take names. But does, does, isn't that what makes this next stage that dangerous? I mean, we've seen mm -hmm. what Putin did in Chechnya. Uh, there's reports of their changing operational rhythm and tactics trying to sure. divide. You know, the, even the Russian battalions are not coordinating. They're trying to move with such speed to divide the Ukrainian but Chechnya, army. Here's the difference. Chechnya was really a series of small bands of rebels. Yeah. Okay. It was not. There's a 250,000 men and women army in Ukraine. Yeah. They're the second largest army in Europe after Russia. They are the most combat experienced army in Europe. Uh, they actually have more men and women have served in the front lines in Donetsk uh, or had served in um, Iraq. And, and that's, not even, including in Iraq. Grandma. that's not even including grandma with the Molotov cocktail. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then they just have sheer guts and determination. As I like to say, and they're you know, defending it's not about the size of the dog in the fight. It's about the size of the fight in the dog. This scenario is a perfect, uh, you know, anthropomorphization of that phrase. These people are determined to kick Russia out. I'm one of the few uh, national security analysts and news media that has said this publicly. I think the Ukrainians can win. I have now seen them on the ground. My, you know, everyone that I know there who is a man uh, and, and several women have taken up arms. That armor convoy that they're waiting for to come yeah. down through Buka uh, to enter the city to the northeast. You know, two days ago, the Russian special forces tried that and they drove very quickly into the city. I was quite surprised that they got as far as the zoo. But I now believe that that was an ambush that was set up by the Ukrainians because it was just the perfect place to wipe every one of them out. And they did it in a matter of eight hours. Tanks are now going to try this. They were in lightly armored vehicles. They were the, the cream of the Russian crop who could fight. Now these are conscript soldiers, some of whom are on contract, volunteers, but they're in tanks. And the tanks can come down with mechanized infantry, but the mechanized infantry is not going to dismount when there is literally machine gun fire from every building in every direction coming down on you, which means now you're stuck in your vehicle, which means now we kill you one at a time and blow up each one of those vehicles and you burn. This is going to be a massacre if they come into the city. I suspect what they're going to do is they're going to mass, they're going to work their way down, and they are going to try a high-speed vehicle blitz into downtown. Putin only wants videos of his tanks at Maidan Square, a place that I love. One of my favorite restaurants is there, The Last Barricade. Um, you know, and what he's going to get if he even makes it there is burning tanks. So Malcolm, let's Maidan talk Square. about like you're, you're talking about the size of the fight in, in the dog, but the, the dog is getting bigger too. We're getting European allies sending legal right. aid. Uh, we well, we have team. the EU... That's uh, funding fighter jets. Uh, do you have information? Is this aid getting in the right hands? Is it getting there quickly? How is that going to change? And related, related to this, uh, if the, if there's a more decisive turn on behalf of Ukraine, do we expect Russia to to, to resort to crimes against humanity, carpet bombing? I sus uh, I suspect that's going to start today. I, based on the attacks that we've seen out in Kharkiv, he needs a major city to fall. 
Melita Paul is actually relatively small. We knew the, the Ukrainians couldn't hold that area down in the south because they need the army to maintain a wall that goes all the way around from north to southeast. So we knew that they would take those areas, but they really can't break out from there. They can't break, move to the Dnipro River. Uh, so Putin needs a major victory. And I suspect what he's just told all of his combat commanders is use whatever force necessary, no matter what the casualties. But let, now, let me ask you he, that, that. He just verifies everything we suspected of him, I right? Mean, yeah, totally. The logic track on that totally verifies everything. It completely undermines the whole rationale that Putin falsely uh, uh, provo promoted and failed to convince uh, anyone with. Uh, but on this and going to, to where Andy's going, you know, how bad is it going to get? You know, if the Ukrainians can win, uh, let's take take that thesis. How bad is it going to get until they win? Uh, what are we looking at? What kind of humanitarian crisis? What kind of death? What oh. kind of um, in, 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 uh, which in, cities are going to be flood. destroyed? Yeah. Like, okay. what, what well, first off, next week, it's, it's going to get worse. It's going to get much, much, much worse. I'm, I'm a firm believer. You cannot take the city of Kiev. You just can't. It's the size of Chicago. Now, I want you to imagine Chicago with like a hundred times more 20 story concrete block apartment buildings as a perimeter all around it. This is Soviet era uh, apartment That's buildings, right. which are massive concrete structures with like 10 or 15 um, all around. So these are, you know, these, these are. Um, uh, very difficult places to take. He doesn't have enough troops. You have to understand that the tooth to tail ratio of, of the guy who is the front line shooter generally has three to four people behind him providing logistics, fire support, all of that. So, you know, um, Putin can have a lot of men, but he doesn't have a lot of shooters out there just because they're there and they carry rifles doesn't mean that they're going to do very well. So do you, you think he's going to start ambushes? leveling? Do you think he's going to start leveling buildings? I mean, is he... Are, are they yeah, he, he, he already started. Bombs? I think as of this morning, I think in Kharkiv, he started. And he's going to try to level cities. Now, another factor. If you start doing that, you yeah. create de debris and, and, and uh, damage to the buildings, which actually add a defensive multiplier. Because now you've got to go you into get bubble yeah. and root things out. Okay, this is, you know, I made this statement several times on TV. I will stick to it now. That in Kiev, all he's going to find, or even Kharkiv will probably come out earlier, is that he is the uh, guest of honor at the largest uh, Molotov cocktail party in history. And, you know, you see people say, oh, well, you know, they're using Molotov cocktails. They only have rifles. The Vietnamese be beat us with rifles. Okay, um, they use Molotov cocktails effectively in World War II. So they can do the same thing. In fact, the Ukrainian government distributed an infographic on precisely which ports in certain vehicles to throw those firebombs in. So when you're burning inside an a armored personnel carrier because you forgot to close the one loading hatch or the machine gunner is out there machine gunning and liquid fuel comes inside. And by the way, they put styrofoam in it so that it sticks to your skin. The military and civilian volunteers lining up to receive weapons, ready to dig in and fight to protect the capital. Okay, that is a force multiplier, especially when all the buildings are collapsed and you can't even see where they're coming from. And they're so coming me, in every direction. Let me ask you a, a pullback picture then. All this happening, Putin yesterday essentially issues a nuclear threat. We know he's got cyber capabilities. What? Why is he doing that right now? Like, like my view would be that if you, you don't issue a threat of nuclear war, if you feel like you're winning, right? But like, well, what is he doing? What's his? What's going on in his brain? Is he's like, I'm going to level the cities, and now I'm going to threaten, you know, annihilation of half the planet. What, what's, it's, what's going it's, on? it's simple. He's losing. He's losing badly. Whatever's going on with Vladimir Putin, uh, and I've talked to people who have met Putin. I've talked to people who used to brief Putin, uh, who would meet with him, they say he is in a very altered state. He is not the same man that he was. Certainly since the beginning of COVID, he has been isolated. He has been paranoid. He has a small uh, coterie of friends around whom were all ex-KGB, FSB, and all oligarch controllers, right? So 
he has somehow put this into his head that liberating Ukraine would be such an easy thing. It would bring it back into the Russian fold. It has nothing to do with NATO being on his border because he has Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland on his border. They're all members of NATO. Um, Ukraine coming into NATO wouldn't have changed very much at all, other than the fact that he would have all these forces. This is about democracy being on his border and that the infection of Ukraine, by the way, Key. Which, which, by the way, then today, you know, and again, we, we pointed out this before, but today President Zelensky asked the EU, and we, since you talked about the 2014 revolution, it was about the EU. Right. And President Zelensky asked the EU to fast track its membership, and the EU would probably do a lot more than NATO to keep uh, Ukraine out of the Russian oh. sphere of influence. But going back to you, he, he's losing badly. Mm. Anything but a clear win is a loss for Putin. And well, right now, the slow loss rate of advance is a win is a for loss. Ukraine. So there's a lot of space in between. And I guess what both of us, Joel and I, are worried about is that to what extent is he willing... You know, today we're looking at this absurdity of having peace talks in Belarus while Belarus is also announcing that it's going to be part of the invasion of Ukraine. So how bad, to what lengths is he willing to go to to, to to get the appearance of a win? And even more important, because we've heard people say this, uh, what is his military? Or what are the oligarchs willing to suffer? Until what are they, they willing to tolerate? How, how no long more. will they let this dynamic because i sorry we're going along long on this no, one no, I, you know but like these sanctions are not your ordinary sanctions uh we just froze the central bank of russia's assets that are more than all of the assets of the entire economy of iran and we mm -hmm. did it overnight and we didn't just do it alone we did it with everybody there are no loopholes there are no uh, little little cracks that the Russians can uh, 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 open wide to protect the ruble, and we're seeing the results. So, uh, and now there's a task force, a joint task force that is going to be manned up by DOJ and Treasury to track down oligarchs mm -hmm. at a level we have never seen and look at all of their assets. And that's like the IRS and seize and, and their and assets seize and their kids' assets, right? Yes, and and so. The blackballing is coming right now for all of these guys. So, like, how long – we're throwing a lot at you here, but, like, how long will those military guys, seeing their army going into this black hole called Ukraine and their assets on the back end, all of this happening, and then Putin in an altered state of mind, really? How long – how long are they going to tolerate this? A threatening nuclear war, seriously, against, like, the the – massive array of, of nuclear weapons pointed at them so so um how predict the future for us well first off that that's that's a level of criminology that no one mm. knows uh the only people that will have any insight on that is the national security agency and the british general communications headquarters right these are the guys who are probably listening to their oligarchs cry to their mistresses about how their, you know, $210 million yacht in Barcelona was just seized by the Guardia Civil and how their executive jet that picks up their croissants in Nice every morning. This, by the way, there is an oligarch that does this. He flies a jet down to Nice. He has his own private bakery. He flies it back to Moscow so he can have fresh French made baker baked goods for his breakfast. And when that jet's seized and the bakery is seized and all of his money is seized and his, you know, his Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis start getting seized in Dubai and other places around the world, then it's a question of whether they have the capacity to influence those people who are around Putin and help uh, either shuffle him out of power, which is a little hard because he controls the nuclear football, or terminate his command. And, uh, you know, I use that line from Apocalypse Now quite specifically. Yeah. But that, too, is fraught with danger. A man who is a caged animal with his finger on 6,000 atomic bombs is likely to do anything. The question is, will the chain of command below him follow those orders? So let's go short of nuclear. Okay. Uh, I the, hope so. The economy, their, their economy of 
is in free fall right now. Uh, and Joel alluded to this earlier. They have cyber capabilities. We saw that in Ukraine in 2014. They shut down the lights. They've been shutting down uh, the lights ever since. And Surprisingly, they're not doing it in Ukraine now. And there's a reason for that because they are they want the cell phone networks up to work for them. Huh. And they must have integrated their battlefield communication strategy to maintaining the cell phone networks. I had predicted that every microwave and cell phone tower in that country would go down in the first week, would be physically destroyed, then to be replaced by a Russian network. They haven't done it. So mobile data, all of these things, there's something that was in the planning that required them to keep their communications networks up huh. and the Internet up. So there have been no cyber attacks apart from the two demonstration attacks against the central bank and the Ministry of Defense. So then what, what, how about cyber attacks directed towards the West? There, there, are, some, there are some analysts who are saying th that uh, we can expect cyber attacks here in the U.S., but most importantly, these smaller allies who have been united on SWIFT and uh, EU sanctions uh -huh. probably don't have the cyber defenses that we have. What are we going to be seeing on that front? Well, right now, the, the biggest threat that Russia has, besides the fact that the, the GRU maintains their cyber warfare capability, is the, the, the use of cyber vigilantes who may or may not be government entities. These are the guys who carry out ransomware attacks. But you also remember that about a year ago, the FBI had uh, identified and, and, uh, and had used NSA capabilities to freeze up one of these ransomware groups. It's, a big, it's one thing to have people come out and do a ransomware attack against an individual hospital and try to get a million, two million bucks out. It's another thing when those ransomware groups become an entity of Russian military intelligence. Now the entirety of U.S. Cyber Warfare Command can go after them with no legal holds barred, right? You'll have our attention if suddenly a massive wave of ransomware goes around the United States. And at that point, that's when we start sending back worms and viruses that melt their laptops, right? And then we start massively identifying where they are around the world and physically killing them, you know, physically uh, not killing them, but physically taking them down or having law enforcement go out there uh, and get these people. Many of these people are not in Russia. Many of them are in the West. Yeah. And they are just vigilantes from Russia. I wouldn't be surprised if you find that some of them are in Miami, right? You when mean it's not that the 700 pound kid in a basement in New Jersey that, uh, that Trump once referred to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's possible it's a 350 pound wrestler looking guy who's <laughs> living in Marseille, France who, you know, runs a cyber group that, that that collects itself from all over other parts of Eastern Europe and likes the money that they're getting. And then suddenly the money they're getting is radioactive now, or it's a tracer where the FBI allows those payments to happen. And when they open up those keys, next thing you know, the National Security Agency takes one of those specialized weapons out of its toolbox that they never use. We never use our cyber weapons. All right. It's like a sniper's bullet. And we only make three of them, one to test, one to kill and one to have in the, the safe so that we can put it in a museum in 50 years. So that is what is facing anyone that does a cyber warfare attack. You know, but let, let, let me get just, impacted by it. Just, um, you know, and, and this is there's so much to chew on. And for our mm -hmm. audience, our listeners, uh, uh, we are we are getting the fountain fountain of 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 in-depth knowledge on so many issues but what is so special about having you here malcolm is you just spent time with the ukrainian people share with us your impressions of them of them at this moment of what they're going to be like throughout this crisis and how they're going to approach handling russia right now well you know while i was there because i was there knowing a war was coming and until the bombs actually fell, none of them thought that a war was coming. They, they sort of adopted a, I wouldn't, it, it wasn't an ostrich with his head in the sand. They were looking up and they knew what Russia was capable of. And their attitude was, we'll deal with it when it comes to us. Um, it's, I went all around the country. I went to every city. 
uh, other than um, uh, Luhansk. I was actually in Donetsk, not in Donetsk. I was in Adovica, which was 210 feet from <laughs> Donetsk uh, on the Donetsk battlefront. That's, it's not true. I did not go to Odessa, but I, so I've been to every other major city in the country. Um, my first thought was, this is a tourist paradise. Why is Ukraine not advertising like Azerbaijan does, right, on CNN International? It's, the city of, of, of Kiev is awesome. I mean, it's like one huge Brooklyn. You know, there's no big box stores. Uh, there's a massive, massive um, general market area to the northeast corner of the city that does have some of these, these things. But mom and pop shops, uh, you know, what the news guys were saying, hipster shops. No, it's just their culture and the greatest coffee culture in the world. It blows Paris, and I used to think Sydney had the greatest coffee coffee culture. Kiev has got that blown away by an order of magnitude. That being said, it was a country that, even though it has the second lowest GDP, um, it's a GDP that people live comfortably middle class in, right? Everybody has a nice new European car. You'll rarely see the old Ladas. You'll see Polish Skodas, and, and I've never seen so many Teslas in any one place in my life. OK, they're even more than Hollywood, uh, you know, Tesla's BMW's Mercedes Benz's, uh, the Louis Vuitton store is, is, is huge. So all of that being said, what you're seeing is a people that insist that they will be part of Western Europe and not be considered an old Soviet bloc drab apartment, you know, apartment block place. I mean, they, they painted murals all over the place on these old Soviet buildings and made them colorful and, and made you want to look at these brutalist looking apartment blocks. Now we're seeing how much damage they can take, right? From that missile that hit the other day, I, I, I was staying near that, um, that, near that neighborhood where that uh, battlefield ballistic missile struck it. Um, that being said, the people are incredible. They are very, very Western. They want to be uh, you know, they, they, there's many, many links to the United States. But I'll tell you one thing. That little dog has a lot of fight. OK. And if you, you know, if you watch some of these videos of the soldiers going, hey, why are you invading? Do you even know why you're here? All right. We're just going to kill you. <laughs> and you don't have to be killed. You can come have lunch with us and we'll treat you pretty nice. And we're actually very friendly. You, you know, Those your, are, most, your most important, important point. Yeah. Your most important point is that they want to be part of the West. They want to be controlled. There are people uh, from the right and the left. Uh, I've seen some European leftists uh, do tweets about, you know, what, what's really the best here is a, a Ukraine that's independent and neutral. Uh, well, Ukraine, the Ukrainians themselves, by the way, that doesn't work. Those are mutually yeah. exclusive. That's that's an oxymoron because the Ukrainians themselves said we're not neutral. They don't want war, but they want to be part not of the Western this. institution. We, so let, let's stop this, revolution this, of 2014. Canard, this garbage that's coming out from both sides. Yeah, both this, this 2014. Right. You, you know, if we want an independent Ukraine, you let them choose. And President Zelensky today asked the EU to yeah. fast track its membership. So that, uh, you know, uh, former Minister Varoufakis or anybody, Tulsi Gabbard, Josh Hawley, you know, oh. stick it. The, 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 the well, Ukrainian. Yeah. Every, every country has a right to so self-determination. No. Every country has a right to self-determination. There you go. That is a fundamental right for the United Nations. Ukraine decided they voted. They've had six presidents in 30 years. And in 30 years, Vladimir Putin has been the sole dictator, yep. right? And now can be president until for life, which who knows how long that is. Ukrainians had their revolution in 2014 because the pro-Moscow shill Yanukovych had pulled them out of a referendum that was going to make them integrated with Europe. They were going to integrate their power structure and cut all of their power supplies from Moscow and have it tied into the European grid. That's actually still on schedule to go if it's not all destroyed here. Putin decided none of their wishes would come true. They would be a vassal state, a slave state to Moscow in the old Warsaw Pact way. And actually, it's not true. They're not even going to be a country. He wants Chechnya. He wants to wipe right. out everyone who opposes, literally. Yeah. Then 
put in a government that supports him and him alone, right? That's and right. then at that point, he will declare them some sort of independent state that's closely aligned with Russia, like Belarus. Keep right. your eye on Belarus. They right. almost put out their dictator a few, uh, a, a couple of years ago. Couple of years ago. That election. Last year, yeah. Plus. And, the, and the government of Belarus overthrew the election. Um, I suspect no, that- No, actually, you know, Russia, for, Russia did. Russia right. did. They came in and, and, and swooped in, but- uh, yeah, no, the, Watch this that is when millions this is, of people start hitting the streets and they want their own color revolution and they start massacring Belarus citizens. So I, Belarus I, is saying they're now going to invade Ukraine. So I got to say this because, you know, I know this is on top of mind for you, Malcolm, all the time. But, you know, this doesn't look like the move of a genius. This <laughs> doesn't look like the move of somebody who actually has a plan. I don't know why one should be called a genius for launching a war they get bogged down in and destroying their own economy. But apparently Donald Trump thinks he's a genius. Well, share with us your views on this whole dynamic. Well, Donald Trump is nothing but a, you know, is nothing but a wholly manufactured subsidiary of Vladimir Putin. You know, I've written four books about that. <laughs> you know, that Donald, you know, in, in my last one, Plot to Betray America, I went to Putin's office in Dresden when he was a baby spy. He loved manipulating people. He wasn't like those other KGB guys who just sat around, ate sausage, drank beer in, in East Germany, and then didn't do any work. Putin went around with the Stasi, and he flipped people. And he was exactly like he is today. He wouldn't talk in meetings. He would just stare with his dead alligator eyes, right? And then he would help them manipulate them to do something they didn't want to do. He thinks he can do this on a geopolitical level now. And that the old KGB methodology, these Stalinist tactics are going to work. Let me tell you, uh, I have seen the Ukrainians now. I met the commander of the Ukrainian armed forces and CNN had him under siege. And they kept asking him while he was in Donetsk with Russians 210 feet away. What are you going to do about when the Russians invade from the north or when the Russians invade from the northeast? And the, the battle commander out there uh, said he got frustrated and he said, I don't care what direction they invade from. I'm going to fight them. And I said, holy cow, that guy's not going to get beat. That guy's going to win. So I think that uh, Russia has taken on way more than it can chew. And in fact, again, I think they could lose. Let me jump in here real quick and because uh, we have five minutes left. Um, can we, if, if Millie was so concerned during January 6th that he called she, um, What's what are, are we on the phone to China now convincing them there's not going to be a nuclear war? If they were freaked out by January the 6th, how are they acting now? Is that is that a good question? Yeah, but, you know, you're looking at one the most stable nation in the world, the United States. <laughs> OK, I'm going to back out and let you Joe ask that question. OK, yeah. or, or, and or another question, if you want to get here in the last five minutes. OK, yeah. I'm going to pop yeah, yeah. out. Okay, Count I'm, three I'm once I bounce. Five minutes. Uh, just to make five sure. minutes. Yeah. Five OK. Minutes. OK, I'll, I'll ask a quick one is so Malcolm. Let's pull it back even one level higher. Putin goes to uh, kiss the ring of Xi. That's kiss how I view it. Mm -hmm. But uh, China is getting a little nervous right now. And nuclear war talk makes everybody nervous. What is the, the play here with China from the United States? And what are the Chinese thinking about their new friend Russia right now? and how to deal with this dynamic that is clearly not going the way she may have thought it was going to go. Well, if anybody knows anything about China, it's that they play long ball. They don't play the short-term game, right? China is not a bunting kind of country. They are sitting there waiting for those long hits going way out into the stands. And anything that happens in the infield, they take advantage of. If Russia's economy is collapsed, China will be there to pick up the pieces. If the Russian army is shattered or Ukraine as a nation is knocked down, it's not going to be Russian goods that rebuilds Ukraine in a Russian Soviet, you know, a, a, a Putin Marshall plan. It will be Chinese goods, right? And that's why she, as an authoritarian, a dictator from a communist country, dictator from life, sees this as letting Russia take all the heat in the experiment of what would happen if China invaded Taiwan. And the funny thing is, you know, I, I play a game called DCS and 
But um, isn't he, I, I got that, Malcolm, hmm. but isn't he a little nervous too? Because why? You know, going going back, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, going back to Joel's like, oh, uh, Putin's reputation of being a genius. That was something we gave him by not playing the game. Or, uh, you know, he managed this weekend. And people are saying he managed, but it was Europe waking up for Germany to drop its pacifist inclination, mm -hmm. Sweden to not really be neutral anymore, Belgium to close, actually everybody to close their their skies. And even look at it to this morning in Bulgaria, uh, the because the defense minister wouldn't <laughs> classify what Russia was doing a war, the prime minister fired him. Mm -hmm. uh, so... You know, this is this goes back to maybe the fall apart of Yugoslavia, where when uh, they told the Germans told uh, the the H. W. Bush administration, this is the hour of Europe. That hour of Europe, we've been waiting for it for decades, and maybe this hour of Europe has come. And now that Europe and the U. S. can seemingly be on the same page, doesn't that make? Uh, a move in the South China Sea, a move in Taiwan, a, a much different equation for China? I think, yes, and, and principally because of what they're seeing us do to Russia. It's yeah. not just Russia losing money in the banks and the stock market and yeah. going after oligarchs. I can't remember the number of billionaires there are in China. It's something like, you know, 2,000. Uh, you know, from all of these people who made money from, you know, putting together, moving up from one shirt per year, right? One quilted jacket per year and no bicycle where you had to walk everywhere to a nation now that produces all the clothes in the world uh, and has, has the most largest car producer in the world. Imagine all that coming to a crashing halt. Yeah. Dead stop over Taiwan. I think that if anything, China is going to learn to finesse this uh, in the old imperial way to where they, they, they keep these good relationships uh, and they don't invade Taiwan. Uh, it's because I don't, as you said, Europe has come into its own. The European Union as a body is not NATO, but it is all of those same NATO countries plus that can behave plus. like NATO. Plus. And now uh, they're purchasing. They're, they're still giving them reams of weapons. With reams of weapons, this war won't end in the Ukrainian. And, and by the way, they're sacrificing. Here, here's something that is this is very important for us here in the United States. That we're seeing higher gas prices. That's mm -hmm. true. They they are actually facing the prospect of no gas. You know, they especially on the eastern front, the eastern front of Europe. We're talking about some European Union countries that are 80, 90 percent dependent on, on Russian gas. So this is this we may be wit witnessing a, a tipping point, a rebirth of some type of Western institutional order. And, yeah. and frankly, I think China doesn't want to see that. China is benefiting from this sclerotic status quo. And if a, well, if a new, if a new uh, arrangement comes out of the EU and, and a rebirth of Atlanticism, mm -hmm. that's not good for China. Let oh, me give well, you, Atlanticism you rebirth you. is now guaranteed. It is that's done. That's exactly right. Done deal. Look, I, the I, EU. You know, Eurasianism was supposed to be Putin's philosophy of the poles of the world shifting to where that's Moscow right. would be the center pole of a right-wing authoritarian Europe, which he was funding. And the United States was going to be a Western arc of autocracy with Donald Trump and the Republicans. I wrote a whole book about this, The Plot to Destroy Democracy. So now, Atlanticism is rock ass solid. I mean, we are now back to 1947. So what you're describing is this is a clarifying moment. Yeah, it is. This is a clarifying moment. And... There are two nuggets I wanted to share as well in what you're talking about that I think are extremely important. The EU is purchasing weapons right. to send to Ukraine. This is an economic alliance now getting in the fight. And Japan... The entirety of the oh, EU. The, and, and, the, and Japan, Japan, as part of the G7, is online with the freezing of the central bank assets of Russia. Japan is sending a signal as well. They are part of this. This is not just a bunch of Europeans. This is a global effort world. of those who believe in democracy, sovereignty, 
independence of political self-determination versus those and, who don't. And right. And look at the nations that right actually now. look at the nations that actually back the invasion. China, North Korea, uh, Belarus, and Venezuela. There you go. I'm done. Did I miss any? <laughs> Maybe Pakistan no. a little, right? Because they're they're playing footsie with the Russians. But I think as time goes on, you're going to see the world who those people who do have relationships with Russia, who think that they can finesse this thing, realize they're up against the whole world. And we could almost call this a the global world war one. All right. Or the economic world war one to where Russia is being Russian is worthless now. You know, you have uh, Abramovich, the, uh, the, the, the owner of uh, Chelsea, right? And they're saying that he's now going to Putin to act as an in-between because he's now maybe kicked out of his own, you know, soccer team in the world. He'll be radioactive, right? SEAL Team 6 will be seizing Russian billionaire yachts underway in international waters and commissioning them as U.S. warships until they pull into Miami and can be sold. I mean, this is a world that he had to have seen, but he doesn't care because he is a dictator That's and right. he only sees his vision of what's going on. Look, Putin, his generals were making up imaginary divisions as they were actually being bombarded in, in, in Berlin. I think Putin is having that happen right now. I, but that that Economic. raises some that raises dangerous prospects. You, like you said, you have a you have an unhinged lunatic uh, in the corner, uh, and his end will not come uh, at, at, on some Mediterranean uh, yacht or, or resort, and and he knows that too. And Malcolm and I, you know, thanks for joining us. I know uh, so much, we, we can go on. And unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I think we are going to go on. Uh, this, is, this is not ending anytime soon. Not anytime soon. Uh, and we would love to have you back. Yes. So we'd okay. love to have you back and, and talk about uh, we are we are living and witnessing history. Uh, we've talked about the Zelensky's emerging as like the twenty for the first, you know, twenty first century action hero. But I also think the moves out of Europe this week, and we are going to remember. Students of international relations are going to be studying how Europe is coming together uh, for for decades to come. So, th thank you, Malcolm. Uh, stay safe out there. My pleasure. Right. This seems to be a big week uh, coming off of a big weekend. I'm, Maybe we're going to be saying this for a long time, uh, but uh, thanks everyone for joining us on Warning Shot. Joel, uh, parting shots. Parting shots. Stay tuned. This is a huge week. It's a, a a week of drama. It's a week of humanity. It's a week of uh, uh, despair, and it's a week of hope. And uh, this is this is again another core reason why we are doing this show. We are doing this show because what is happening over there directly impacts us here. It all matters. And we just had one of the best with Malcolm Nance laying it out for us. Uh, this is our fight right now. This is what's happening right now in the world. And it is happening here at home as well uh, in, in this debate, in this discussion. So uh, we, we, are, we are lucky to have had this kind of discussion uh, and and we are going to have a lot more of them, as Andy says. And stay tuned, everybody. Tune in and uh, and join us. Be part of our discussions. Great. Andy Zamanidis and Joel Rubin, thanking you for being part of the Warning Show. <laughs>